Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday morning here at Calvary Chapel. There we go. That, that's more like it. Well, let's worship. Let's, let's begin with a word of prayer first, though. So, Lord, we come before you, and God, we're so grateful for this time together. Lord, we're so grateful just for your goodness and your mercy. So, Lord, I pray now that you would just bless this service. Lord, that you would anoint the worship team. And God, I just pray that you would help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And so, Lord, we give you this time now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome again. Welcome for tuning in online. So good to have you all here worshiping with us. So why don't we all stand as we come before our mighty Lord of Lords and King of Kings and worship Him in spirit and in truth this morning. Amen. Amen. That's right. if you'd like or remain standing 
However, you would like to worship the Lord this morning. Once again, just so grateful to be here to be able to worship God with the family of God. Amen. 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 This next song is a newer song, but the title is Oh, Praise the Name. Right? The chorus says, Oh, Praise the Name of the Lord our God. So as we sing this song, when we get to the chorus, let's just praise the name of the Lord our God. Amen. me that we are very blessed people. We are blessed to still have the right of assembly together here as a family to worship and praise God. It, God blesses us because he loves us, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. He doesn't demand or require anything from us 
but he is blessed and pleased when we return that love to him with a thankful heart. Father, we ask you please to bless these tithes and offerings, knowing that they will be used to further your kingdom. In the precious name of Jesus, our Lord, amen. Amen. Blessing and honor, glory and power, be unto the ancient of days. From every nation, all of creation, bow before the ancient of days. Yeah.
This time I would like all the kiddos to come up front. You know, I said that at first service and nobody moved. There was crickets. I got sad. Crickets. But I'm happy now. This train is bound for glory. This train. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory. Nobody rides but the righteous and the whole. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is a free train. This train. This train is a free train. This train. This train is a free train. Everybody rides in jail. love you in Jesus name we lift our children up to you and pray just for an abundant uh, portion of grace just to be shown in each of their lives God as you've shown us so much grace we pray for that grace to be imparted to them this morning as they hear the word of God as they do activities to learn about you Jesus just touch their hearts and their minds this morning in Jesus mighty name we pray Amen. Amen. All right, if you could take a moment and greet somebody this morning. Normally I got to come down there and lead half of you to your seats, but... Okay, just a few announcements and then we will continue on with worship and a few other things. But first and foremost, do we have any first-time visitors here? We do back there. We have a, a lovely gift for you to let you know just how welcome you are. All right. And with that being said, just a few reminders before we continue on. One is to keep the homeless outreach ministry in your prayers, please. Um, Bernie and the team, as they go out to those dark places and um, shed the light of the gospel, they definitely need our prayer, uh, first and foremost. But also... Um, if you so feel led, they could use large tortilla shells and bottles of water as they, on Monday mornings, what happens is uh, the, the team from U-Turn and whoever wants to come shows up here at the church at eight in the morning. We have a Bible study and then they prepare burritos and we pray and they go out to the uh, park and minister to the homeless. So please keep them in prayer. Uh, it's a vital ministry that we have going on here. A lot of fruit from it, too. 
And then also the next installment of the Bible Basics class will be tomorrow at 6 p.m. I believe it's the 5th class that we have running in this. So, uh, you know, if you've been to the other ones, make sure you attend. I know uh, it's been well received. And also on the 27th, we have the movie 5,000 Blankets. It's a true story. It's based on a true story just about, you know, what the love of Jesus and the love for people can do in the lives of, uh, uh, you know, individuals. It definitely has an impact. And this movie's kind of takes a look at that. It's pretty inspirational about one lady who just started loving on the community and it kind of grew from there. So if you'd like more information about the movie, you can see Pastor Aaron. I know he's seen it. Or if you'd like to know more about the matinee, Pastor Frank is around here somewhere, or at least he was. He can give you more information about it. Also, we could use a, some more volunteers to be greeters. So if any of you have been feeling led to get more involved in the church, uh, you can see me or Pastor Aaron, and we'll get you hooked up as a greeter. Then also, we have a new home group starting with Brian and Monica um, at the Refuge Center. So it's kind of for younger, middle-aged uh, couples or families or whatever. And Brian said he will be carding you out the door. So if you're old, don't show up. Or at least bring a fake ID and then he might let you in. I don't know. Or see Monica. She's actually nice. Brian, not so much. But no, I'm teasing. Well, sort of teasing, it's pretty true, but we'll go with that. All right, and with that being said, before we get on we, with the uh, next worship song, we are blessed to have uh, State Representative Lily Morgan here with us today. And uh, she's going to come up and speak and give us some updates on what's going on in, in the Salem. And also, um, just to be able to, you know, uh, help us to know how to pray and how to get activated behind some of the stuff that's going on. You know, she's a wonderful uh, woman of God that Linda and I have known for a long time, and we definitely need to support her, her and uh, be in prayer for her as she. There's so much darkness at the state capitol, and you know, she's one of the ones that's shining light and fighting uh, the good fight for our Christian worldview, because they are definitely in the minority up there, and it's a tough fight. So, Lily, here you go. Yeah. Oh, and I just saw one more note. So the potluck on Wednesday is going, the theme will be Italian food. So there you go. So bring Italian dishes or... We're just going to start doing this according to my diet after this week. So I will let you know what I can eat, what I can eat, and you can bring that stuff. But no, Lily, there you go. That's hilarious. I've never been to Italy, but I've been to Italy. So I. <laughs> uh, good morning. And I, um, for those that don't know, I am Lily Morgan. I am the state representative here for Grants Pass. I was born and raised here. This is my home. Uh, it's just so surreal to uh, Pastor Kevin to see your grandbaby uh, because my Kennedy that is now 12, uh, you know, my sister was pregnant with her when we met you. And uh, so just as time goes and uh, what a blessing you and Linda have been to our family and have become family. Um, but even more so, I went to the church that built this building and when I was 13, my dad would throw me on the drum set over there. Uh, and so it's kind of neat to see a youth on the drums here as well and that uh, everybody has a part. Everybody gets to be there. So um, before anything, I am a daughter of the King. I am a believer in Jesus Christ and I am saved by him and his grace and his righteousness alone. And it's important to know that um, I'm not alone in Salem, in that there are others that believe in the Lord. I am surprised sometimes that those that believe maybe vote on different things, and you're like, how? How do you vote on those things? But ultimately, I know that no matter the length of the season that I'm in the state capitol, that for the purpose of going is to shine Jesus's light. 
And, and so if that's the opportunity, and I got to say, we all come under attack. We all come under those uh, challenges to just kind of exercise on our own knowledge and our own experience. But I have to remind myself daily and spend time in the word and remind myself that it's by his righteousness, not mine, and that I need him. I don't have the strength. This last week has been one of the hardest weeks uh, the last the last couple weeks have certainly been more challenging than than ever, but uh, you know, God built us funny. We have these built-in release valves. You get to a point that the pressure gets to a point, then you cry. It's like the steam valve went off and you just release. That was this week, uh, and the week before. And uh, but but everybody that goes there, everybody that's serving at the local level, every one of us have our things that are going on behind the scenes. Um, my family has had decades long trauma and abuse behind the scenes. And in the last week, one of my cousins who's now 40 years old spoke up against it and said, in the name of Jesus, this sin ends now. We are gonna shine light in the darkness and not let this continue. And there's been some healing going on in our family as people are acknowledging pain and trauma that's happened and said, no more. In Jesus' name, this is going to, we're going to have healing over this. And I bring that up because it adds to the emotion of when you're facing work. During the first service, I got a call that my cousin passed away. And I was with her last night, and I know she knows the Lord. And just 15 minutes before she left, her boyfriend was sitting there next to her and said, it's time for you to go to the Lord. And she peacefully went. And I let Pastor Kevin know that I was expecting that call this morning. I didn't know when it would come. And as we're letting family know, but right now you see in the last few years how angry everybody is in our country. In our community, there's outrage. We see things going on that we never thought we'd see. And our instinct is to fight and get angry and unfortunately we don't come down from that anger and I don't know about you but when somebody jumps in my face what do you naturally do you step back you don't engage them with a hug you're kind of like ah, get away from me but that's how we're all interacting today and how do we actually have an impact where we can say where do we find that healing where do we find hope there's no hope without Jesus Christ. And, and so there are some evil, evil things that we're seeing happen. And in that, different people have different thoughts on how me as your state representative should react. Do I yell and scream? Do I softly speak and fight? Do I not show up at all? Those are all the kind of choices you have, right? I got elected to represent this district in Salem, but there's some things that are so evil, people are like, you shouldn't even bother going. Don't even lend your voice to it. And I gotta say, it's been something I've wrestled with greatly. And when it's so horrendous, what's the reaction? What do you do? In my life, I've been blessed to have a career that I get to work with other people. I, for the majority of my career, even though I've had various roles, uh, they tease, I, in my judiciary committee, I'm teased that I'm the Forrest Gump of the legislature because I've worked every job ever. Uh, literally, a topic will come up and I said, well, I've done that. Matter of fact, this year, one of them was, well, the school bus bill, blah, blah, blah. I said, I drive school bus, I know that one. Uh, but for the majority of my career, I was a parole officer. And so as a parole officer, you, I tease that I was a social worker with handcuffs. And <laughs> you, what I found is, but for the grace of God go I. I'm not any better than, I just simply have Jesus in my life that's helping me make different decisions. So how do I, in speaking with somebody, point to the cross and say, here's your hope. Here's, here's the solution in your life. And you can't always do that when you're in a state paid job, but you can do it through your testimony, through your interactions still. And I'm the only legislator out of 90 that has that background. And it's led to some very interesting conversations of, of which um, a couple individuals 
have come into my office that uh, should not have. One of the men, for instance, was convicted of aggravated murder. In Oregon, that's a death penalty sentence. Part of his plea deal was that the death penalty was taken off the table, but he was given a conviction of life without the possibility of parole. He was never supposed to get out of prison. And his sentence was commuted a year ago, and he's been out. And I didn't know what his crime was, but I've been able to interact with him. As a parole officer, I've supervised people convicted of murder before. But I had the opportunity to interact and talk with him, and he's told me some of his story, not all of it. And then the next thing I know, I'm being asked to be interviewed by the Oregonian saying, well, what's it like? Isn't this a success? And I said, I got to tell you, before I do this interview, I don't know their crimes yet. I know they went to prison. There's a couple of them that come to my committee. And so my staff member said, Lily, you do a disservice if you don't know what they did before you talk about your relationship with them. And so I looked it up. It doesn't get more evil than what they did. There's, a matter of fact, three of them that I've been interacting with, and the one that's most recent in the last two weeks has been in my office twice, committed a crime in this community in Grants Pass that caused a lot of pain. And I know the family members. And so after knowing that, then what's my responsibility? As a parole officer, my job was to help somebody choose a different path so they don't come back and commit new crime, right? The goal of every parole officer is to work yourself out of a job. What's my role as a Christian? My role as a Christian is to remember that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that there's only salvation in one, and that's Jesus Christ. But there's also consequences. So how do I wrestle that balance? It's been a very fascinating experience and to sit down with some individuals that have done the most horrible things ever and to be able to have a conversation with them. And in the Oregonian interview, what I said is the only just thing would be to also sit with the victims and say, tell me how it's impacted you. Not just how your life's changed, because all of our lives can change. If I hadn't been elected, I wouldn't have had this opportunity. It's, it's amazing. But then there's also other things that come about. Because of my past, I serve on the Behavioral Health and Health Care Committee. So dealing with the, out, the outcomes of how Oregon decriminalized, or first we made any drug crime a misdemeanor, and then most recently with ballot measure 110, made it a violation. And so now Oregon is a destination for people to come because they know they can freely use without any outcome. And we see people dying in mass and overdoses. And they're making a game of it in some places. How close to death did you get? Did you see the white light? Did you see the gray light? I've had local treatment professionals reach out to me and say, please stop this insanity. We can't do this. And, and those in power in Portland, and I say it that way because numbers matter. I believe that a life can change and, and, and the way that they do that, like with U-turn, that you turn to Jesus, you are clean and sober. It's not a matter of playing with the substance. You walk away from the substance. Right now, Oregon's focus by those in Portland that are making the decisions are saying, measure 110, even though it said we're gonna give you treatment and recovery, we're gonna focus on harm reduction, so we're gonna give you clean needles and we're gonna give you Narcan. So you can continue to, to use, and here's a way to get out of the overdose, but not that hand out. Right now, Calvary Chapel Grants Pass has a ministry in the parks to the homeless. Some would say that's enabling those to stay living on the streets. But where did Jesus go? He, he didn't just say, come to me clean. He said, I am the water that gives life, eternal life. And how does somebody know Jesus unless somebody shared that message with him? So Calvary Chapel, keep listening to the Holy Spirit. I am going to say, not everything that we will say, everyone agrees with. I've yet to meet a married couple that agrees 100% on every topic. But just as our society is in this rage, in this anger over what they're seeing, We've also gotten to a place that we can't actually have conversations when we don't agree. 
oh, you, you did that. I will never vote for you again. I'll never talk to you again. You are canceled. The job doesn't matter. The Bible says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and darkness. As this stuff is coming up, and one of my staff members that comes to Salem with me, she takes on the expense of renting another apartment in Salem. From, she's from Grants Pass to go and be there so to help me in my office. She used to run the pregnancy care center in Cave Junction. And then we faced some legislation this session that is horrific. House Bill 2002 is one of those. It takes away a parent's right to know if their child's had an abortion. It's removing the age limit for which a child can have an abortion without parental knowledge, to be specific. The earliest documented pregnancy in the United States is nine years old. So now a nine-year-old who can't decide what they're having for breakfast is being told to make a horrible life decision without seeking their parent in that circumstance. Why are we destroying families? Because God created family. Why are we destroying life? Because God is life. In this circumstance, we'd bring up all these topics and say, why are you allowing children to change, permanently alter their bodies through surgery for what they're calling gender affirming surgeries? And yet you see suicides going up through, through uh, it's out, uh, you can't even count them anymore. Here, don't not use drugs, you can keep going. So these are all the decisions that go through my committee. I'm on judiciary, I'm on behavioral health, health care. The very night that we voted on this bill, House Bill 2002 in our committee, they also took away the rights of Oregonians to have flavored tobacco. Now in Oregon, it's already been passed that you have to be 21 to buy tobacco, an age restriction, 21 because kids can't have tobacco. So we made it so you have to be 21. But because kids are still getting flavored tobacco and can't be trusted not to start smoking as a youth, we're going to ban all flavored tobacco in all of Oregon for any adult to have because kids can't be trusted. And the very night we voted on that is the same night we said we're going to let nine-year-olds have abortion without their parents knowing because they can make those health decisions by themselves. And on the floor of the house, we were told we're empowering children. No, we're not. We're destroying families. So I wrestled with the decision of how do I take part in these bills? Do I show up? Do I protest? Do I do what? And ultimately, the House Republicans and the Senate Republicans have been working together towards what we can do to, to fight this evil. And the Senate asked us House members to stay and get some things on the record and to fight it. And so I did. Some locally have said I betrayed us because I allowed the vote to happen. But that's where that prayer comes in and having the, the Holy Spirit guide and direct. And, and we did fight the bill. I even shared personal experience of my childhood on the floor that was a very vulnerable spot. And uh, I believe sometimes by allowing that to happen, to have the Lord shine light in those dark places, that others can come to know the Lord through those experiences. Why do we tell our testimony? because it's by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony that Jesus is who is our savior. I would just ask as we are facing these horrible things and we're doing everything we can to change them, but we need you to be covering us in prayer. We need the Lord to give us the wisdom and discernment and what we're seeing and to make the right judgment decisions of when do you build that relationship to keep pointing to the Lord? Or when do you walk away and say, I'm not even gonna have the conversation? It's not easy choices. Just like going to the park and ministering to the homeless, it's not easy. Either is their lives that they're doing down there. It's not to stay using. It's to point to Jesus so you have a way out. But whether it's my job in Salem or your job in the park or anything else you're doing on a daily basis, we're all facing these decisions. As you're dealing with a coworker, as you're dealing with your family, 
we're all facing that. And what do we need? We need us as a family to come alongside and point to the cross and say, Jesus is your hope and your strength. We can't do it without prayer. I can tell you the day that the House Bill 2002 went to the floor in the house, a group came and they were in the upper gallery and they just prayed all day. And I know it made a difference. You could sense the difference of the peace that you could have to fight. The Senate asked us to get past 6 p.m. We started at nine in the morning to argue on one bill. We went to 7.30 p.m. We went, you know, we like to talk. No, we had to get things on the record and we had to keep it from being pushed through to get voted on in the Senate. And now it's stalled because the Senate has walked and they're holding it. But we got things on the record. We filed a lawsuit already. We're fighting because we know that we can't give up on Oregon. We can't give up on our communities. And more importantly, we can't give up on our children and our families. So, so I would encourage you to continue to lift us up in prayer. Feel free to email and say, I got you covered. Whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, I'm praying for you, state representative, state senator, county commissioner, city councilor, school board member. Every one of us need God's wisdom and, and, and his guidance. And on top of that, I would just encourage that if you hear things in the community, counter it. In Jesus' name, let's seek him in this. Let's stop fighting amongst each other and pointing to what is the real source of light and darkness. Jesus Christ is who we need to be seeking. And so in the anger and everything else that comes up, are we covering that in prayer? Are we surrounding the circumstance as a family and pointing to Jesus? Thank you for having me here this morning. I appreciate that this is family and that we can gather in prayer. We can gather freely and do that still. I've been in the Soviet Union when it was under communism. I've been in places where you can't gather freely. I am grateful that we can. And guess what? We're not always going to agree. There's going to be times we battle. Families do that. But by God's grace, we keep going. So thank you, Pastor Kevin, and thank you all. And before Lily leaves, let's... Uh... Let's lift her up in prayer like she asked. So Lord, we come before you and once again, we're so grateful that you've placed people like Lily in the, in the, up in Salem, Lord. God, I pray that her light would shine in the darkness there, Lord. God, that you would just use her in a mighty way. Lord, as she mentioned in first service, Lord, let her have that Esther moment that she's there for a, a time like this, Lord. And so, God, I just pray that you would be with her. You would continue to bless and protect her, Lord, that you would guide her and give her favor. Lord, we do pray against all of these bills that she talked about, the 2002 and, and just all of the evil that surrounded it and, and uh, you know, just all of it, Lord. We just give it all to you, God. We ask for your guidance and your wisdom and Lord, that you would have your way. So Lord, once again, we thank you for Lily um, taking from her busy schedule and coming to just give us an update of what's going on there, up there and how we can support and pray for her. So Lord, just be with her now. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thank you. Amen. Well, I shared with first service, so I don't think it's fair if I don't share with the second service, right? Um, you could laugh. It's, it's okay. <laughs> huh, thank, huh. thank you. Oh, see, what a blessing. They got my back. So it's no joke or it's no coincidence is the word I'm looking for that um, as she was sharing, even the first service, you know, I heard her speak twice now and what we need is hope. And this next song talks about all of our hope is in Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen.
care if you stay seated or not. You can stand up if you want while I preach, but it might save some of you from falling asleep. So since January of 2022, we've been going over the epistles of, uh, to the Corinthian churches, right? And now as we've uh, transitioned in the second Corinthians, just as a a little review, because last Sunday was Mother's Day, and, and so we took a break. Uh, just where we're at, right? So as we went through the first book of, of Corinthians, um, you know, it was Paul dealing with the church and all of the issues that were going on, right? If you remember, the, the, the Corinthian church was messed up. You know, there, uh, Paul had to correct the division and he had to correct, you know, the bad theology and he had to correct their conduct and and just some of the things that they were allowing. And it was a pretty harsh letter. Right. And so then uh, at the end of it and the beginning of um, Second Corinthians, chapter one, you know, Paul had told them, hey, I'm going through Macedonia and I want to come stay with you guys for a while. I want to hang out with you guys for a while. But things happen, don't they? You know, and um, and so the people in uh, the Corinthian church, a, a group of them started using the fact that 
Paul had a change of plans, and we'll get into it a little bit more here in a minute, um, to say, to, to degrade, you know, Paul's word, right? He's saying, oh, he doesn't really mean what he says he means. You know, he told us he was going to come hang out with us for the winter. He didn't make it. He didn't come. And so you can't trust anything he says. You know, he says one thing and then does another. And trying to really, uh, you know, limit his authority or, or what have you. Um, because isn't it just kind of the way the world works? It's a lot easier to point out other people's faults or their sins. Because when you're pointing somebody else's out, you don't, the, the light isn't shined on your own, right? You don't have to deal with your own. It's a lot easier to say, look at his sin. And that's my granddaughter. <laughs> so if I'm distracted, that's why. So I recognize that squeak anywhere. <laughs> okay, so let's focus, people. So, oh yeah, it's me who needs to focus, isn't it? So anyways, you know, Paul, he was. He wanted to come to... Um, back to the Corinthian church, you know, it was, you know, he loved that church. It was one of his babies, right? And, but he couldn't come back um, because while he was in, uh, on his way there, he was in Ephesus. And you might remember in Ephesus, he kind of caused a commotion. He caused a stir. Um, he was preaching the gospel and a funny thing happened, you know, in, in that area there in Ephesus, there was a great temple to, to Diana, right? And a lot of people were making a lot of money, the silversmiths, off of selling little idols of Diana. Well, when people were getting saved, they were no longer spending their money on the little idols of Diana. You know, they were, they were no longer uh, into the idol worship. And because of that, uh, you know, it caused a big disruption in their income, and they weren't going for it. You know, they were pretty ticked off about it, in fact. And we read about it in Acts chapter 19, verses 23 and 24, it says, And about that time there arose a great commotion about the way. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen. You know, so here he is, he's making his living off of these little idols that he's making, right? And all of a sudden, people are getting saved, and they're no longer wanting these little idols. They're no longer buying them because they realize that there's only, you know, that this is simply that. It's a false god. There's only one god, and He's a true and living God, and they weren't buying this, and it, it, it troubled them. You know, it, it, so he caused this great commotion, and they were trying to, as you recall when we went over it in Acts, you know, they were trying to rip Paul apart. They wanted to get rid of him and his influence in that culture. So Paul's friends, you know, Paul was always up for a fight. It, that wasn't a problem with him, but his friends using common sense and judgment you know, told him to get out of there, and he went to Troas, and, and from there he went to Philippi, where he wrote 2 Corinthians. And so that's kind of leading into where we're at in these verses here. Uh, beginning in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, let's pray, and, and then we'll talk about it more. So, Lord, we come before you once again. Lord, we just ask that your Spirit would open up the Scripture now as we look at your Word. Lord, I pray that you would just give us soft hearts to heed what your spirit has to speak into our lives. And Lord, as I always pray, I pray that you would give us courage to be doers of your word and not hearers only. So Lord, we give you this time now, and it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So in verse 1 of chapter 2, Paul begins with, But I determined this within myself, that I would not come again to you in sorrow. You know, like I said, he had, he had written 1 Corinthians, and it was very corrective. And it caused a, a, a lot of, you know, heaviness and sorrow, uh, which happens sometimes when you're confronting sin, right? When, when you're confronting, you know, in that particular church, it, he confronted a lot of stuff, if you'll remember. It took us like 14 months to get through all of the stuff that... Uh, he was confronting all the there was a bunch of difficult issues within the church that he was dealing with 
And he knew that it was human nature to shoot the messenger, not right? Instead of focusing on the message and, and dealing with it and saying, okay, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, we have all this stuff that we've allowed to creep into the church because the Corinthian church did. It was basically uh, allowed the culture to creep into the church, right? They were suing each other and they were doing all of these things just like those outside of the walls. You know, you walk into the Corinthian church, you couldn't tell much difference between those on the inside and those on the outside. And it grieved Paul and he was dealing with it. You know, he was like, uh, he didn't want to come back there um, and bring sorrow and the heaviness, you know, because his influence at that particular time, if he would have showed up, he was like, no, you know, you guys wouldn't have focused on the message or the one who can, who can make the corrections. You would have, you know, put your focus on me. And we'll see that through these uh, first four vo verses that he was saying, I don't want my presence to cause you guys more sorrow. And in verse two, he continues on and it says, for if I make you sorrowful, then who is he who makes me glad but the one who is made sorrowful by me? You know, he's saying, hey, I'm looking forward to celebrating with you. I'm looking forward to experiencing that joy there is in the Lord, right? You know, I want to be able to spend that time with you together as a church family. He said, but I'm determined not to come, not to bring that heaviness with you. You know, I want to come at a time where we can all be joyful. You know, because he also knew, kind of as, as Lily uh, alluded to, sometimes we get in the way of the Holy Spirit, right? And that's what Paul was saying. He was saying, hey, if I come right now, the focus is going to be off of what needs to be done, what the Holy Spirit is doing to correct the stuff going on in the church. And the focus is going to be on me. You're going to be, you're going to be, you know, all that angst is going to come against me. And we see that all the time and we deal with it all of the, all of the time as Christians, don't we? You know, I get uh, phone calls and stuff about, for instance, our homeless outreach ministry. Well, why aren't you guys doing more to remove the suffering of these people? But, and my response is always the same. Why would I want to get in the way of the Holy Spirit? You know, whatever the case may be, yes, uh, we've, I've been doing homeless outreach for years and years and years. And it's always usually in the, that particular case, there's one of three re reasons why they're homeless. One is there's a certain amount of mental illness. Two, there's some form of addiction. Or three, they're running from the law, right? And so when we see the homeless out there and you see them out in the elements and they're suffering or whatever, I don't necessarily want to make them comfortable in their sin. Because typically it's bad choices that led them to the spot where they're at. So instead of you know, going in there and making them as comfortable as they can be in their sin, I would rather offer them a way out. I would rather offer them an opportunity uh, to experience the same joy and hope that we have, right? You know, and that only comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the only way. So yes, we will feed them because they are hungry. But we feed them physically because that gives Bernie and the team the right to speak to them, speak into their lives, to be able to preach the gospel. So we use, in this particular case, food as a tool, right? But it's that way with any sin uh, that we deal with as a church. You know, we don't want to remove necessarily the consequences of it. What we want to do is introduce them to the one who can make eternal changes in their life. And that's what we see here with Paul. He was saying, I don't want to get in the way. You know, the Holy Spirit is doing something within the church. The Holy Spirit is convicting. The Holy Spirit is causing a commotion so that all of this can be brought to light and dealt with, right? You know the old saying, uh, uh, you know, when you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps the loudest is the one that got hit, right? And so with all of this commotion, that's what's going on here. And he says, I'm not going to be a part of it yet. I'm going to remove myself. As much as I want to come there, I'm not going to come at this time because it's going gonna, it's gonna to have an adverse effect. Once it's the right time, and in God's timing, I, will, I would love to come back again. 
So in verse 3, as he continues, and he says, I, And I wrote this very thing to you, lest when I come, I should have sorrow over those from whom I ought to have joy, having confidence in you all that my joy is the joy of you all. You know, he's saying, I'm writing this epistle to clear some things up, you know, to, to make sure that things get settled, that when I do come, our overall experience will be joyful, that we can celebrate in the Lord, you know, and we can celebrate in the goodness of God, not, you know, not focus on all of the, the heaviness and, and the sorrow coming from the correction that I sent to you earlier. You know, it should be rejoicing as we worship and fellowship uh, in our relationship with Jesus Christ. Then it says in verse 4, For out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears, not that you should be grieved, but that you might know the love which I have so abundantly for you. You know, I love this because Paul... Uh, often speaks about the tears uh, he shed over the church and the anguish in his heart that he's felt because of the things that he sees, the things that were going on, right? And so as he declares them to the church now, he reports them, you know, the, the condition of his heart, what he's feeling, what he's going through because of all of the stuff going on within the church. You know, he's saying, I wrote this to you with many tears. You know, I think about the time when, uh, you know, as Paul was ministering to the elders of the, of the church of Ephesus, you know, he reminds them kind of of the same thing that uh, he makes mention of them, uh, you know, uh, of their tears, right, of, of how he was through his tears. You know, he had a heart for the ministry, didn't he? He had a heart for the church and for, for the people of the church. Thinking about what he wrote to the Romans in nine in Romans nine three, he says, For I I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen according to the flesh. You know, I love you can sense, you can feel his tremendous love for the people there, can't you? I don't know about you, but I'm not there yet. I, I couldn't I've never once said, man. I'd go to hell if it meant that, you know, my, my fellow, you know, the fellow people around here would be saved. I'm not there yet. I don't think I'll ever be there. But that was kind of Paul's heart. He was saying, you know, for I, w I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. Uh-uh. I'm sorry. I, I, I love you guys, but I ain't ever going to wish that I'd be accursed Christ. Just saying, just being honest, right? But that was Paul's heart. You know, it's, it, what he's really saying here is that, you know, I would go to all lengths, you know, that you would come to know the same Christ that I know, that you would come to have that relationship with him, right? You know, it's all about the, the tone, and that's really what he's saying. Um, you know, uh, if you'll remember when we, on Wednesday nights when we were going through Genesis in chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned and, and they realized their nakedness and out of shame they hid from God, right? And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 9, we read, Then the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? You know, in this tone, a lot of times it's read or it's preached on kind of like a, uh, an arresting police officer, right? Where are you? What have you done? You know, type of thing. But no, uh, really the tone that God had is, where are you? The heart of a broken father, right? What have you done? You know, why are you hiding from me? Why do you even have the knowledge to know to hide? You know, how do you even know you're naked? Right. It was out of a heartbroken father. It's not out of a you know, uh, this. And that's the way Paul was, too. You know, we read in Isaiah chapter 59, verses one and two. It says, behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden his face from you. You know, when we sin, that communion that we have with God gets broken, don't we? You know, um, when we sin, our iniquities separate us from God. But you know what? We serve a God, a loving Father uh, that seeks us out, doesn't he? Where are you? 
what have you done? Come back to me. Right? And that's really the heart we see with Paul. You know, um, that's the heart that uh, he has, just kind of like God had. You know, he had wished that he would be a curse so that his countrymen, his fellow uh, countrymen would know the Lord. You know, it's that same kind of heart, isn't it? That heart brokenness, the fact that, you know, it's the battle is real. The struggle is real, isn't it? You know, it's a life or death struggle. We see it in this culture we live in. How many, how often do we hear about people overdosing? How many people have we seen from this church or have gone through U-turn that have over, gone back out and, and fell back into their sin? And it cost them their lives, you know? The battle is real, isn't it? Then as Paul continues in 2 Corinthians in verse 5 through 7, he says, But if anyone has caused grief, he has not grieved me. But all of you, to some extent, not to be too severe, this punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. So that on the contrary, you ought to rather to forgive and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one be swallowed up with too much sorrow. If you'll recall in, in his first epistle to the Corinthians church, in, in chapter 5, one of the problems that he addressed is there was someone there who was in a sexual relationship with his father's wife, right? And if you'll recall, not only did the church not speak out against it, they were proud of the fact that they tolerated it. You know, they gloried in their tolerance for allowing this to continue on instead of dealing with it. And Paul corrected it, didn't he? He said, you know, you allowed it. In fact, you kind of gloried in the fact that this was going on. See how tolerant we are? See how great we are, you know? Um, but isn't that kind of what happens in the church in America a lot of times? You know, we'll tolerate. Oh, look at how you know, tolerant we are. You know, we're more worried about being politically correct than we are about being biblically correct. But that's not what Paul told the Corinthian church to do, and that's not what the Holy Spirit is speaking to us, is it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, where it's, Paul writes, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. You know, he's saying even those who don't believe, the non-believers, it's not even named among them. They wouldn't even tolerate it, but you guys are tolerating it. What is your problem? Why would you do this, right? And so then he instructs the church how to deal with it in verse 5. He says, Deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul says, you know, this person who has this unrepentant sin, who has this, uh, you know, is living a lifestyle that goes against God's standards, don't have fellowship with them. You know, if you go to them and and you talk to them about their sin, and if they're non-repentant and won't change, then they need to, you know, church discipline needs to be um, administered, and they need to be sent out of the church. Why? It's not to, uh, uh, you know, to take vengeance against them. It's in the hopes that we send them out to the world, and as it says here that, you know, Satan basically has their way with them, and they realize uh, the ultimate goal is that they be saved, that their soul be saved, right? You know, there's a, it's always about restoration, isn't it? It's not about judgment because that's not ours to do anyways. That's between God and them. But for us, it's about not tolerating the sin. And it's also about the eventual restoration of that person that's living in sin. You know, we want them to realize the weight of their sin and what grief it's causing God, right? And so to go back to these verses here, it says in verse 6, um, not to be too severe, the punishment which was inflicted by the majority is sufficient for such a man. You know, he's saying glory in the fact that this guy that you guys kicked out in 1 Corinthians 
is now repenting, right? He's saying, don't hold it against them anymore. Restore them. They've repented. They've changed. You know, what a beautiful testimony it is, right? In 1 Corinthians, they kicked him out of the church. Now in 2 Corinthians, Paul's reporting saying, hey, this person's repented. It's time to forgive them. It's time to bring them back in the fellowship. It's time to restore them. You know, that's what we're called to do as a church, isn't it? We're not called to hold grudges. We're not called to be, uh, you know, um, to have long memories of these things. You know, why would we as a church choose to remember what God's chosen to forgive, right? If somebody is truly repentant and, and they've changed and they've gotten right with God, then it's our job to restore such a one to the church, to bring them back in the fellowship and surround them, right? That's our job, uh, because let's face it, God's forgiven all of us of things. He's restored his relationship with us. You know, he doesn't hold grudges against us. No, he says that as far as the east is from the west, our sins and iniquities, he'll remember no more, right? So why would we want to with, with people who have, who have sinned here, you know, that we've had to have church discipline? Now, we should glory in the fact that they've repented and coming back to God. You know, we should gladly receive them. That's what we're supposed to do as a church. Amen? And as Paul continues on, it says, Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm, reaffirm your love to him. You know, like I said, in the body of Christ, there must be a place for forgiveness. You know, as Christians, we must have a place in our heart for forgiveness, right? You know, because we have to forgive because we've been forgiven much, have we not? You know, there has to be a place for restoring someone to fellowship, you know, because that's the ultimate goal of any correction. It's like a parent. You don't punish your kids because it's fun. Well, some you might, I mean, I've seen the way some of you have parented, but you know. But for the most of us, it's to cause a change in behavior, right? And it's the same way with the church, you know. It, 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 yes, sin is tragic, but repentance is beautiful, isn't it? You know, when we see a life change and someone coming back to God, you know, we should be rejoicing in that. So when someone confesses that sin and, and they've given it up, uh, you know, we as a church, we need to make sure that we're restoring them in the fellowship, you know, and helping them as they, you know, attempt to rebuild their lives or whatever it is. You know, Paul writing to the church in Galatia, he says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespasses, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. You know, we are to restore, aren't we? You know, with, I like this, with the spirit of gentleness, uh, you know, that's what we're called to do, right? There has to be that place of restoration within the church, within our, the, our relationships as Christians, you know, within our heart. You know, we have to be able to do that. You know, yes, this guy uh, that Paul's referring to, he was guilty of horrible sins, right? But he repented from them. God forgave him. And Paul's saying, you know what? Confirm your love towards him. Remind him how much he's loved. Remind him how much God loves him. Remind him how much the church loves him. And how glad you are that he's repented and turned from his sin. It says, for to this end I also wrote that I might uh, put you to the test whether you are obedient in all things. He said, you know, part of why I wrote this the last letter to you was to see how obedient you're going to be. You know, because there were some severe measures that you were being asked to institute as far as, um, you know, church discipline. And it's not easy. It's difficult. But I wanted to test your obedience to the Lord and what he's commanded you to do. Then as he continues on in verse 10, it says, Now whom you forgive anything, I also forgive. For if indeed I have forgiven anything, I have forgiven that one for your sakes in the presence of Christ. You know, Paul speaking with the authority, obviously, of an apostle, right? Because Jesus, when he commissioned the apostles in John 20, 23, he wrote, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. You know, like I said, uh, Paul is speaking with 
the authority of apostle, you know, the way that Jesus had commissioned him as an apostle. You know, the idea of our sins being forgiven. Uh, you know, these verses sometimes are taken out of context, aren't they? You know, for instance, the Catholic Church, you know, that they can, you can go to confessional and that a man, uh, you know, can uh, abolish your sins. No, there's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ, isn't it? We only have one mediator between man and God, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to go through anybody else, do we? You know, and there's no one else other than our relationship with Jesus that our sins can be forgiven. That is the only way. You know, there's not a church. There's not a person that can absolve our sin. It's already, if we're a child of God, it's already been paid for anyways. The penalty for our sins have already been taken care of. It's been forgiven. We don't have to. You know, because ultimately, let's be honest here, our sins, whatever they are, they're, we, when we commit them, it's, we commit them against God, don't we? You know, think about David when he sinned with Bathsheba. And it was a downhill hill spiral, wasn't it? First of all, it was a glance at Bathsheba. Then it was adultery. Then it was murder, covering it all up and lie, all the lies and stuff. And David, when he reached that point where he was broken and he was crying out to God, he wrote this in Psalm 51. He said, have mercy upon me, O, Lord, o God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge." You know, David is saying, um, I have sinned against you and you only, right? You know, when we sin, we're sinning against God's word, right? When we sin, it's ultimately, it's between us and him. Yeah, there are, um, in a lot of cases, our sin has consequences and it kind of has uh, secondary issues, doesn't it? Where we hurt or we offend anybody. But ultimately, when we sin, it's between us and God, right? And that's what David's saying here, you know, um, that all we have to do is confess our sins to God. We have a loving God that's, uh, uh, you know, his loving kindness and mercy and his grace uh, is much greater than anything we've done. You know, and the fact that Jesus, when he uh, was on the cross paying the penalty for our sins, he said, it is finished. It's done. It's paid in full. There's nothing that you can do to earn salvation. He already took care of it. All we have to do is come to him, don't we? You know, there, we can't work enough. We can't, whatever it is, there's nothing that we can do. It's already been done for us, you know. And I love that. All we have to do is come before him and confess it. As it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, right? It has nothing to do with us, does it? It has everything to do with him and his faithfulness and his just and the fact that he's just it has nothing to do with us. We change. We're fickle. We can wake up on the wrong side of the bed and be in a bad mood, right? But God never does. He's always faithful even when we're not. He's always just, even when we've acted unjustly. You know, his character never changes over time, does it? Thank God for that. We can always rely on the fact that, uh, you know, as long as we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins. You know, we don't have to hide from it. We don't have to run. We don't have to live in fear. Then he finishes up this section of scripture with, lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You know, once again, that's one of the biggest problems in the church today is that we don't really understand or we're ignorant of Satan's devices. You know, we don't really understand that we are in a spiritual battle, 
aren't we? You know, it's not political. It's not whatever. It is a spiritual battle that we're dealing with and that we're dealing with on a daily basis. You know, in fact, later on in the same epistle in chapter 10, Paul tells us just that. Beginning in verse 3, he writes, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You know, um, when we fight in our flesh, what fruit is there? There's anger, there's hurt, there's, you know, we say things that uh, we wouldn't otherwise say, right? We make a mess of it. But when we battle in the spirit, that's when we have those victories, don't we? That's when those strongholds that are talked about here in our families and in our lives and in our, our country can be torn down. You know, we need to understand that it is a spiritual battle. But you know what? We serve a loving God, too, has given us the spiritual weapons that we need to be successful, don't we? He's made them available to us. And he lists them in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. He says, uh, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You see, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, are they? No, our, the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds of the enemies that's in our lives, that are in our families, that are in this country. You know, we look and we hear as, as Lily talked about how the state is trying to legislate away our parental rights, how they're trying to do all of these things that go against the Bible. But you know what? We can yell and scream and we can do all of these things, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Those are all carnal responses. The first things that we need to do is fall to our knees and pray, isn't it? The first things that we need to do as a church is humble ourselves, don't we? And then we'll see things change. But we need to start using the weapons of our warfare because it's spiritual, isn't it? You know, and the thing about it is we know that ultimately the victory is ours already. Are we going to grab a hold of it? We've been assured that we are more than conquerors. We're walking from a place of victory. We don't have to cower down and be fearful of, of what man has to say because God's already fought the war and, it's, and he won. He's already disarmed all of our enemies. All we're doing is we have to fight in the, the little mop-up battles, but the ultimate victory's already been done, amen? We, Romans 8.37 tells us that, yet in all these things we are more than conqueror through him who loved us. You know, it's, uh, we need to recognize that, that, uh, you know, if we look at this from the physical realm, it can be overwhelming. We can see all the darkness and evil around us. But if we put on our spiritual goggles and we see what Christ has really done from us and we walk in the spirit instead of the flesh, then we can have the confidence of walking in that victory, right? And so how do we do that? First of all, uh, it's to recognize who's in control, right? That this is a spiritual battle. It's not a physical battle. 
And that we can't do it on our own. In fact, we don't have to. Christ will fight those battles for us if we give them to him. Second is to resist the devil, right? We know that from James 4, 7, where it says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, it's, this is a two-parter here, isn't it? First of all, it says, therefore, submit to God. You know, the key to the Christian walk is being obedient, being obedient. It's to submit to God, isn't it? Because I guarantee you, if you can't do the first part, you're definitely not going to be able to do the second part, which is resist the devil, right? You know, first and foremost, we have to submit to God, then resist the devil. And what happens if we resist the devil? He'll flee because he has no power over our lives when we're walking in the spirit, does he? You know, um, uh, I hate the, the Christian excuse. Well, we're all sinners saved by grace. Yes, but that doesn't mean we have to sin. It means we choose to sin. In fact, we have the power over sin so that we don't have to sin. You know, that's just the truth of it. You know, are we going to start walking in the victory? Are we going to start speaking the name of Jesus over all of these strongholds that we've allowed the enemy to, uh, you know, place in our lives? You know, the archangel Michael didn't. When he was fighting over the body of Moses, he spoke the name of Jesus, didn't he? It says, Jude 9 says, Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. You know, he didn't get in some cosmic fist fight with the devil, did he? No, Michael just said, You know what? The Lord rebuke you. And it was done. It was over. He spoke the name of Jesus over him, and the devil was, um, you know, powerless over him, wasn't he? It's the same for our lives too, right? We are more than conquerors. All we have to do is speak the name of Jesus over it. You know, I love that. And so as we uh, start to close here, um, I want you to remember that. You know, I want you to realize that when we put our eyes on the world, when we put our eyes on our problems, they become big, don't they? You know, there's nothing more that the enemy would like than for us to take our eyes off of Jesus and put them on the problems of the world or the problems in our lives, right? Because whatever's right before our eyes becomes big, right? I use that example all the time. If I'm looking at my problems right here, that's all I can see. But if I'm focusing on Jesus, all of this becomes small potatoes, doesn't it, you know? Because compared to the power of Christ and what he can do in our lives, our problems become small. So we need to focus on Jesus because it doesn't matter what problems you're facing. It doesn't matter what trials you're going through. It doesn't matter because there's only one answer. The answer is always Jesus. That's it. It doesn't matter. I don't care what the problem is. And so as we finish up here, I want to leave you with this one verse, uh, you know, from the first epistle. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so as the worship team makes their way up here for, to lead us in a final song, you know, if you've never tapped into that victory that comes with a relationship with Jesus, let today be the day of your salvation. You know, or if, if you've uh, started walking in the flesh again and you're being beat up by the world and you need to come back and draw, as it says in James, you know, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You want to come back and draw near to him. There's going to be pastors and elders and their wives up here to pray with you. Come do business with God before you leave this place. And if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, like I said, let today be the day of your salvation. Tap into the power so that you can walk in victory in your life. Amen? Let's close in prayer and then they'll do a final song and then you'll be excused. So Lord, we come before you and God, we're so grateful for your word. We're so grateful that we can, um, that our, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're spiritual, Lord, that you've equipped us with. 
Lord, we thank you for your finished work on the cross, knowing that you've paid completely for all of our sins. So, Lord, we just are grateful for who you are and what you're doing in our lives and in this church. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. for joining us remember wednesday what's the food theme mexican food all right we'll see you on wednesday night